Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Revit Pure Live. This is a show where we geek out about Revit. Sometimes I do it by myself, and sometimes I have a guest, like today. Uh, before moving on to the guest, there's a couple of things I'd like to show you. So, just putting the screen up. Uh, first, a, a big thing, this show is basically going to be uh, a weekly show from now on. Well, at least uh, for the upcoming months. Uh, every Wednesday, there's going to be an episode of Revit Pure Live. And the next guest, uh, next week, it's going to be with uh, Josh Rattle, who works for Enscape. And he's going to come in and talk about uh, the new Enscape 3.0. They just released uh, a big update. They have a brand new logo and they've redesigned uh, completely their user interface. So this should be a lot of fun if you guys like uh, Enscape, like I do. Else, well, uh, obviously there's no official sponsor to this show, but if you like uh, this video, you can have a look at the Revit Pure website. Um, you can have a look at the blog where there's a free content to help you learn Revit. And you can have a look at some of our premium learning package, like the basics learning package. I'm assuming if you are here, you're probably intermediate to advanced user, but who knows, maybe some beginners too. Uh, but uh, for your staff, maybe that's a good uh, learning ideas. The package is made to be super simple and super efficient and fun to use. You can have a look at revitpure.com slash basics. And something else, the design package. It's um, this one is special for me because I've I've been told so many times that uh, Revit is a terrible design tool and that you should always go back to a SketchUp and uh, AutoCAD to do a real design. And I I disagree. I think Revit can be a powerful design tool if used properly. So on this uh, learning package, I go through techniques to create. Uh, present presentation documents like this, presentation plans, how to create uh, planting families, for example, beautiful 3D views, entourage families, section perspective, exploring a few rendering tools, and virtual reality. Uh, so everything is made to be simple and efficient. Uh, there's a template, videos, and families. You can find more about it and download a, a sample chapter at revitpure.com slash design and just have a look at the whole thing. And if you don't want to pay, that's completely fine. You can have a look at the blog. A lot of useful content, I think. Okay, so let's go to uh, today's guest. I'll make a brief presentation and then we can go to her. Pervi Irwin is an architect and BIM educator based in the DC area. She currently works for CAD Microsystems as a BIM consultant. In addition to being a BIM expert and an architect, uh, she has a master's degree in historic preservation. She worked as a preservation specialist uh, architect at Quinn Evans Architect for 10 years before becoming, in her own words, a full-time Revit Sherpa in 2015. <laughs> uh, so let me switch to a live view, Pervy. Welcome to the show, Pervy. Hi, thanks Doing? for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, uh, I'm excited to have you. It's uh, always fun. <laughs> the, we've met at the Bill Conference in Seattle yeah. in uh, 2019, and uh, for me, it was the my first time speaking at a, a big BIM conference like this. Mm -hmm. And you gave me a lot of uh, great advice, <laughs> and you told me about your own experience as a speaker. So, it, so yeah. that was greatly appreciated. Oh, of course. Uh, so thanks. And before we get going about schedules. Um, yeah, reading your bio, I've read about historic preservation, and that's a question I get quite a lot about mm -hmm. how to use Revit to leverage phases in the historic building context. I'm wondering, do you have a, a good resources for people doing uh, historic preservation? So I actually do. So uh, I have a webinar that I give through my company. We have a whole series of webinars. So CAD Micro, we're a value-added uh, reseller for Autodesk mm -hmm. products, uh, along with Bluebeam and FM Systems. And so we do a series of free webinars that happen all the time. And one of the ones I do is Revit for Existing Buildings. So I actually uh, created that one when I started working at CAD because uh, I you know, was the first person with that kind of background to work there. 
Yeah. So if you go to our website, there's uh, there's a spot at the top for uh, learning and then recorded webinars, and it's uh, Revit for existing buildings. Uh, and you can we give them live, and then we also have recordings of them. And so there, I talk about some of the tips and tricks that I learned throughout my years. So I actually started using Revit in 2008, and the only projects that I've ever done in production have been existing buildings. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them historic mm -hmm. buildings. Mm -hmm. So all over DC. Um, and so um, I am a firm believer that Revit uh, can be. I, what I say at the beginning of my presentation is Revit's not not made to do any one particular kind of building, which makes it so that you can do it for any type of building because mm -hmm. you can make it do what you want it to do. Yeah, right? yeah, sure. And that's, that's what I love about the schedule piece, which is why I'm happy to do that. You know, the idea that right. it's a tool for us to to mold to what we need it to do. Yeah. What buildings did you work on at your 10 years experience in architect? Any <laughs> highlight or something you're especially so, proud of? Yeah, so actually my very first Revit project, and I don't know how many people have been to DC, but the National Academy of Sciences building, which is right on the mall, it's at the far end of the mall. There's a big statue of Albert Einstein in front mm -hmm. of it. So if you know where the Albert Einstein statue is, the big building behind it. That was the first Revit project that I ever did. Uh, and I actually did that project in Revit from schematic design all the way through CA and close out. Uh, so it was the first fully digital CA project. It was a very, it was fun to, to kind of trailblaze. Uh, so that was one of my, the projects that I'm most proud of. Uh, another project I'm proud of, which was not done in Revit because it was right before Revit, was Eastern Market, which is also in DC. And it's just a very beloved uh kind of old old type of inter interior market where there are mm -hmm. different vendors with stalls. Um, and uh, it was an Adolf Kloos building. So I don't know if you've heard of Adolf Kloos. Uh, he also designed the Alexandria City Hall mm -hmm. uh, and a few other buildings. Unfortunately, a lot of his buildings have been torn down since, mm -hmm. but we were able to, to renovate the Eastern Market. So I think those are kind of two projects that I'm especially proud of because I worked on them kind of the whole the whole time and then kind of the last one which isn't a preservation project but was a renovation was the Terrace Theater at the Kennedy Center which is the okay. big performing arts center here in DC and the that was a super fun Revit project because the interior of the whole theater is uh wavy wood panels oh, okay and yeah. so, so I fun. actually yeah. And it was a really fun actually scheduling issue because oh, we yeah. made all of these wavy wood panels and we used assemblies inside of Revit. And then we had these complex schedules so that the contractor could connect because they were regular curves put together. Mm -hmm. So it was like three, three curves put mm -hmm. together to make a panel. And I had to figure out, OK, they can't be more than 10 feet long. And how do we lay them out? And then how do we schedule them and how do we tag them? So it was actually a whole big exercise. And uh, and I left the firm before that project went into construction but my friend who did the CA said that the the woodworking subcontractor was very impressed with our documentation so oh, that's cool. we did something right so that is that uh, uh, part of how you get your passion for uh, schedules I think so yeah I just okay. I really I love data like I'm, you know like mm -hmm. most people yeah. who who work in our industry we're kind mm -hmm. of data nerds yeah, too yeah. and so the fact of you know Revit's a database at heart mm -hmm. and so sure. to me whenever I explain schedules I say you know the schedules are the I in BIM right they're that yeah. information that lives inside of your model so yeah sure yeah I think that's probably where it came from, was trying to figure those out and then just trying to push them to do more so, things. So you said the first one was National Academy of Science, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll just quickly share. Uh, that's this building. I'm sharing your screen, can it see? Okay, yeah. back to the main program. So uh, as we just said, a, a point in common we have is that we are both big Revit schedules nerd. I also love schedules. And a few months ago, I was researching schedules and I came across uh, your multi-part blog entry on the CAD Microsystems blog. And mm -hmm. uh, I love that. And it was super helpful on my research. So thanks for that. And that's why I had the idea to bring you on to kind of show me uh, highlight reels of the, this uh, blog series. Do so you get ready to get going? Yeah, yeah. And actually, that series came from a presentation that I gave at the Built Conference. Mm -hmm. And I turned that presentation into the, the oh, series okay. of schedules. Oh, yeah. That so, was from the 
the build. Was that uh, from that time in Seattle that you gave I that class? I think, I can't remember if it was that one or the mm -hmm. one before. Oh, okay. I think it might have been the one before, the the one that was in St. Louis. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I was, I did that because the, the Seattle one was my third one that I okay. presented at. Yeah. All right, so let me switch to a view. All right, like this. Oh, you've prepared right. a special, special special page. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I took the, the file that I had from mm -hmm. that and sort of made some updates and, you know, edited some things. Mm -hmm. But yes, this is our, this is the startup page. I'm a huge proponent of startup pages in all of your yeah, Revit files. That. So this is, this is a, this is like a kind of a title block splash page that we use mm -hmm. when we make templates just as a placeholder. And, you know, we edit it as our clients want to include the information that they want. Um, but yeah, always super helpful. Always do this in, yeah. in our projects. So, so yeah, it's a title block. So it fills out project information. I know this has nothing to do with schedules. Well, it kind of does fills out information mm -hmm. there, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, so Nicholas had given a sort of a list of topics and I started with that list and then I kind of expanded on it. So I wanted to start with just a couple of things that are newer features that were added in the last couple of versions. Cause I know that there have been a few updates to schedules, not a ton, but a few, and I wanted to talk about those. So this is one schedule that I have here. This is a sheet list schedule. But one thing I wanted to talk about, and this is this is actually something that I know people have wanted for a really long time, and I think they added it in 19 or 20. Um, if you hold down control on your keyboard and you roll your mouse, you can actually zoom in and out. And I can't can't tell you how many times in the past, you know, 12 years that I've been using Revit, people are like, it's so small. How do I see it better? And mm -hmm. you could do that. You just hold control and zoom in and out. Yeah, so, I know. It, it, when <laughs> did they introduce that? I think probably like 18 or 19. I don't think it was before 19. Yeah, I know. I'm pretty because, sure yeah, it's a amazing. relatively new And feature. most people don't know about it. No, they don't. They're That's why I wanted to show it. <laughs> That's why I figured I showed yeah. it the first thing. Yeah, yeah. So hold control, roll the roller ball on your mouse, and it will zoom yeah. in and out, which is great. Yeah. Um, then another thing that got added, I think in 21 actually, was this freeze headers, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's the other thing. We have mm -hmm. these like super long schedules mm -hmm. and right, we're like scrolling them and we don't know like what call, what are my headers, right? Yeah. So there's this freeze header now, which is really great. So then I'm scrolling up and down in this super long schedule and I can actually see my headers. So these are very simple things, but they're really simple things that really help you a lot <laughs> to be able to work in your schedules. Um, so, and then the last kind of quick little new feature is in 2020, they added the ability to stripe your rows different mm -hmm. colors, but it was only in the schedule editing view. It wasn't on your sheet. And so in 2020, there's actually a button like up here. It's it's somewhere in right here that's like stripe rows and you just turn it on and it makes one gray and one white. That's all it does. Mm -hmm. In 21, though, they added it over here into the appearance tab. So if you so go into they the... They removed it from the ribbon in 2021. Yeah. Okay. Because they actually made it better. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. because it's not just in the schedule view. Now mm -hmm. you can actually see it on your sheets. So they added it here. So now it's this section. So they added this like stripe row section here. So all you do is you choose it. Okay. And then now it will stripe. So you can choose whether you want them to be striped or not. Um, and then here you choose the two different colors that you want for your rows. So you actually say the first row and you click here and you can pick the color. So let's say I want it to be like blue just for fun. And then you go to the second row and you can pick a different color maybe green. Right. And then when I say, okay, it's going to actually stripe my whole, that's like really blinding, but <laughs> it's going to actually stri <laughs> stripe yeah. my whole well, uh, dance, schedule. Yeah, right. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. And the nice thing here is you can actually choose whether you want it to show up on your sheets or not. Mm -hmm. So you can either, if you uncheck this box, it will only show up here in the working view, right, of the schedule or the editing view of the schedule. But if you click it, it will also show up on your sheets. So it's a way to give you some horizontal color, which is nice because when you have really long schedules, it's hard sometimes to follow the rows across. So I think the colors really help um, with that. So what's going on with the purple uh, cells? 
Yeah, so I was going to talk about that okay, actually. Okay. The um, very next thing. Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right. I was going to. I'm kind of covering like all the appearance stuff yeah, yeah, together, yeah, yeah. and then first. I was going to jump into like data stuff. I don't want to go stuff. too fast. <laughs> yeah. Like so, um, so I'm going to actually turn this off because it's blinding me. But <laughs> all right. So, um, so those are just some of the new features. So I just want to show those. The last couple versions they added those features. They haven't really added too much more. So that's kind of that's kind of it for now. Um, but one thing that I related to the graphics that I really like to use is color. And I like to use color because color helps you to identify what parameters are for. And then I also like to use it because the color will show up on your sheet, right? So I always have two sets of schedules in my projects. I always have a working schedule and I have a printing or a sheet schedule. So I have the version that is how I want it to look in my documents. That one goes on my sheet. And then I have a, the secondary working one, which shows me a lot more uh, columns. And so what I like to do is, first of all, I like to, to shade my header so that I know this is a working schedule. It's not supposed to go on a sheet, right? So you just click on the cell and you go up here to shading and you make it whatever color you want. Um, and then the next thing I like to do is any of the, the columns that are supposed to be hidden, I make those a color also. So that if somebody goes in, and I do that actually in my working schedule, and then I take my working schedule and I duplicate it to make my sheet schedule, and then I hide the columns. So if somebody does accidentally do unhide all in the sheet version, they know which columns are supposed to hide again. Mm -hmm. So that's where color can be really useful. So I always, always, always shade the columns that are supposed to be hidden in my print views that I have in the view because I might need it to sort, right, for sorting and grouping, but I don't want to see those particular columns. So I'll make them a different color. So in this case, like these three are uh, pink because they're hidden. And one thing that I like to do just tangential to that is you'll see this um, sheet group and sheet subgroup, right? This is how I organize my sheets in my project browser. So I actually create three sets of parameters. I do view group and view subgroup. I do schedule group and schedule subgroup. And then I do sheet group and sheet subgroup. And that way I can help organize how my views are in my project browser. And I can tie the values, at least for the views, I can tie those to the view templates. So when I make a new view, it assigns a view template and it puts it in the right spot in my project browser so I can find it. So the same thing with the sheet group and the sheet subgroup, it helps to organize the sheets in my browser so I can organize them by different categories. I can do them by discipline, whatever you want. There's two tiers of parameters there to help you organize things. So that's what those are. Uh, Just a quick and then, question, sorry yeah. to in interrupt, oh, sure. is, um, so when you were setting uh, the stripe rose color, mm -hmm. uh, basically the, the, the shading of the cells themselves as priority over um, stripe rose. Yep. yep. So it doesn't yeah. affect uh, cells would have uh, with a color like you've said. No, it doesn't. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we noticed that right. Like when we turned yeah. on the striped rose. Yeah, they're not affected. It, it didn't shade mm -hmm. like anything where you had highlighted the row and colored it. That took mm -hmm. precedence over the striped rose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and I don't know, I mean, I'm not sure if this feature is going to get any, like, additional, you know, features to it. Um, but I think that typically, I don't know of a lot of places that stripe columns to put on sheets. So it may not really be an issue if you want to print with the striped rows, mm -hmm. uh, because that'll be the only color mm -hmm. that's there. Um, so... Yeah, but yeah, you're right. It does that. That's the hierarchy is that when you select a column and you give it a color right up here, that's the the color that wins. <laughs> um, so I am going to come back to this schedule um, in a minute, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about some other things that you can do to help add more information to your schedules. So I have this other schedule over here, which is an area schedule. And I'm gonna use this to talk about a few things. But the first thing I wanna talk about is what I've done up here at the top. Um, so I've actually added some instructions. You see that? So this mm -hmm. is the header of my schedule. And I have found 
with, because I make templates for a living, that um, when I'm trying to tell somebody how to use something, if I give them some separate document, they're never going to look at it because they're not mm-hmm. going to remember that it's there or like, you know, it's going to get lost or whatever. So I try to put as many instructions as possible inside of the Revit template. And the best place to put those instructions is in a working schedule. So you can tell people what the values are for, how the schedule is working, how it's sorting, how it's grouping, you know, if it's an area schedule, like what area scheme it's based off of, right? Because there's no way of knowing when you click on a schedule that goes with an area scheme to know which one it goes with. So all that information is really is is really valuable. And that actually um, is super easy to do. And this is really funny. So about, I would say, this was right before we went into quarantine. So maybe like last January or so, I was I was uh, at one of my regular consulting sites and one of the people that worked there showed me this trick and I was like, you did what? I had never seen this before. You can take the header of any schedule and you can add rows and columns to it. So I don't know if a lot of you who are watching knew that, but if I go up here, for example, yeah, I click I, in here, I've heard, right? I, I think I saw that in the menu, but on a... I always thought to myself, well, why would you want to add a row? What does it mean? You know, it's rows are yeah. data from the model. Yeah, but it helps for here, right? Yeah. You can add instructions. Uh-huh. Never or, about it this way. Yeah. Or this is the other thing I've done. I'm going to open this other thing that I've shown you that I made in a, in a t- this is from a template that I've made. I actually made a dumb schedule. Mm-hmm. And it's all a header schedule, right? So if I need to organize like code data and I want to put it on my sheet and I have certain rows of data and certain columns of data this entire schedule is all a header oh wow and i can put that on my sheet and now it's organized nicely right now, are because these that's... parameters or they're nope. okay they're, they're, it's, it's just, just like text. they're just pieces of text yeah so this is just um you know you pick some like random category that you're never going to schedule <laughs> Right. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I'm an architect. I'm not going to use MEP fabrication, anything. So it's a good random category to use. And then you just have to add like one field, Uh but you don't have to put any data in it. And then you just add rows and columns. So I'm going to go back over to this one. So if I'm in here, all I do is if I want to add a column, I just click that little insert, right? Oh, I guess it was there. I want it to be here. I guess it adds adding it. Oh, this one's merge. That's why. So if I go up here, I can go unmerge and it will kind of show me all of them or I can, and then I can take these and I can merge them together. And, you know, if I want to take those and merge them together, I can merge them together. I can move them around. You know, I can actually take any of this text and I can change the font to like any font, any color, any size, just inside of here. Um, so I try to make these working schedules as bright and in your face as possible <laughs> so that people won't accidentally put them on a sheet. Uh, oh, that, but that's this amazing. is, I didn't know you yeah. could do that. Yeah. That's really right. Cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and this was something that one of my clients found and just like started doing. And I was like, this is really awesome. Mm-hmm. And I was like, but I got to go back and look and see if this is going to break anything. And I went mm-hmm. back and I talked to my colleagues and a couple of them are like, yeah, I kind of heard of that. And I did a little research and it doesn't break anything because you're not, actually affecting any information it's not data from the model it's just mm-hmm. kind not of text in just inside text. the schedule like stuff yeah That's right. okay so if you need to do like some sort of dumb um schedule right just a table right i just need a table this is my code analysis table i'm always going to have the same information mm-hmm. i can make this put it in my sheet and my in my set and now i know exactly what information I need to fill out. Yeah, that's so, really cool because I've done that with title blocks, but you have to uh, to add parameters inside the title blocks. So that's really helpful. Oh, yeah, that's kind of a pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um that's great. But yeah, so so this is a really cool mm-hmm. um, little trick. Now, it can you don't want to go too crazy with it yeah, because okay. it's very not smart. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so like, you know, if you want to make everything like the right the same width and stuff, it's kind mm-hmm. of a pain because like it if you try to make the whole thing wider, it gets mad at you and it does other weird things. And if you want to make all the rows like the the rows, you can make them um you can adjust the size uh, 
like by dimensions, which is great, right? You can just go here and like drag these, but mm. that's not very, uh, very precise. So you can actually go here and you can go to the resize here for the row and then you can type in an actual value. So I am very type A when it comes to like the layouts of my schedules and having my columns, my rows all be like actual dimensions. Mm -hmm. So I will definitely use these resize for the rows and the columns to make sure that everything is not just some random dimension. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, I know. I sh I should do that more. <laughs> <laughs> I get really like I get I get I get hate it when it's like slightly off because if I have like say yeah. I have two schedules right on my sheet and uh, I want them to be like the same width and then one has like five columns and one has six columns, I can use the math and figure out the dimensions and then make them line up so that they actually line up properly on my sheet. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's the art part of architecture, like making everything look nice and <laughs> laid out on yeah. your drawing sheets, right? Yeah, so. I know. Just uh, having a look at the comments, Benoit says, I found out this a few weeks ago. So some people might have heard about this trick. Yeah. Uh, Samuel says, header is a great place. No, he says, title area is a great place to add scheduled notes and dump those drafting views. Uh, I'm not sure what he means. I guess he, he might use the, the, the title areas for notes. Oh, so instead of having like just a, a like a legend for it or something, you could mm -hmm. do that too. Yeah, I still like, I think I still like the legends. I think it's a little bit nicer to organize stuff, but you could have it that way. You're right. If you wanted to just have like a list of notes, you could put like the numbers in a column and then the text in the other mm -hmm. column and, just for organizing sheet notes or something like that. And, and just to be clear, the, the one with all these extra uh, rows and um and columns for notes, it's only for internal use. And that's why you put all these colors to explain the schedule. Yes. And then on the sheets, it's kind of the same thing, but without the colors and without these extra lines, mm -hmm. right? Yep, yep. Yeah, so I'll usually make the working schedule first mm -hmm. and color everything and then duplicate it for the sheet schedule and then hide the stuff mm -hmm. that I don't want. If I need to sort it differently or group it differently, I'll do that there. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'll make the and then I'll make the header white or whatever some some companies I work with have like a light gray for the title area of their schedule um so right. whatever that works so so that's kind of the how like different graphic things but I know we really want to get into like the data part of it <laughs> so I do want to talk about I want to start with um, conditional formatting, because I know that that's something that not a lot of people use, but it can be really useful. So here I have a room schedule. And if you're doing a lot of planning, right, if you're planning out spaces and you're given a set of criteria by your client, like I need to have offices that are at least this big, right? And a conference room that's at least this big. And you have certain prescribed square footages for your different spaces. You can actually use your schedule to check that your spaces are um, meeting those minimum requirements. So that's what I've done here. So what I have, let me, I'm gonna zoom in on this, okay, is I have this, this column here is the actual square footage reported by the area, okay, and then this is just a, a, a parameter where you type in the program square footage. So what is the square footage of this room supposed to be based off of the program that my client gave me, right? It, this is the minimum. And then what I've done is over here, I've done a calculated value where I've taken the program square footage, right? Or I've taken the actual and subtracted the programmed. So let's look at the, let's look at that formula. Um, yeah, here. and also that, that will answer a question from some someone. Uh, Joe says, hi guys, how can we use formulas like Excel and schedules? Thanks, regards from Tijuana, Mexico. So that yep. so that's calculated values. I'm going to have a bunch of other uh, formulas I'm going to show you here. Right. I have a I have a few other right. ones. Yeah, Joe, that's you the are in part. good hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a simple one, right? It's just taking the area and then subtracting the programmed square footage, right? Now, the thing with ca with calculated values is that it has to be like a greater than or less than sort of thing. It can't be like um, a range, 
<laughs> or you can't say like, and it has to be greater than or less than zero. This is why it's a little bit, and I'll show you what I mean. So that's why like I had to create this calculated value to give me the difference between the actual and the programmed. Okay. So I have that. So then when I go to this, um, when I go to my formatting and I go to the name, I think, uh, yes. And I go in here to conditional format. You're going to see that I have the condition is, is if, is if the SF difference is less than zero, make it a color, right? Because see, it's a negative number, which means that my actual is too small. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, you could flip it around and say if it's more than like however, however you write your formula, you know, but this to me was logical because I took here's the actual and here's what it needs to be. And if the actual is mm -hmm. too small, then my difference will be negative. And so I want it to show me that it's a color. Right. And it's conditional so that if I make this room bigger and it becomes more than 130, then this will go away and this won't color anymore. Right. So like as soon as I go in here. So, for example, let's say like this. Um, this bathroom, right, is supposed to be um, 340. Okay. So as soon as I type that in, it's too, the, the actual is too small. And so it colored it, right? But if I said, well, maybe it only needs to be 300, then now it's not colored. See? So that's the conditional part of the conditional formatting is uh, it's based off of a value. And is a program SF, is it... Um... A shared parameters that you've created for uh, no, it's just because it's just a calculated value. It's, okay, it's just a calculated, yeah, kind of an empty value. calculated value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just the one that I made because you don't need a whole parameter just for that. No, because and I need to, um, yeah, and I only needed it for in here, mm -hmm. uh, to, to make that formula, mm -hmm. right? So, okay, so yeah, now one thing you want to know, right? If you so since, um, Calculated value parameters are, cre are only exist in the schedule that you make them in. So if you want the same calculated value parameter in more than one schedule, you either have to duplicate the schedule to have it or you have to remake it. You can't pick it from the list of parameters because it only it's made just in the schedule that you make it in. So if you duplicate the schedule, it'll get remade. And if you delete it from your schedule, it'll tell you that you're deleting it because you are because it only exists in that schedule. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to. So if I you, were you to. You mean the program this, SF uh, row, a column? Yeah. So, like, if I go here and I delete it, it's going to tell me that it's permanently deleting it. Right. Because it's not like a parameter that I picked from the list, it's mm -hmm. one that I made just in this schedule. And, and if you decided to use it as a parameter instead, could you use it in multiple schedule and kind uh, uh, of preserve the same value? Um, you'd have to, you could either re, yeah, you could, I could go to a different room schedule and make the same mm -hmm. one, or I could duplicate this schedule and then it would already be there. Okay. Yeah. So I just like to, yeah. So, so if you remove it, it deletes it. It doesn't just move it back over here <laughs> like a normal parameter. Right. Um, okay. Then another one that I want to show you, which I have, I know a lot of people want to do is over here. I'm going to go back to this fun area schedule that I have is a lot of times people say, okay, I, this is, this is a unit matrix, right? So you're doing multifamily and you need to count like how many of each type of unit you have. And instead of having it be like first floor and then list it second floor and then list it, this is a trick to kind of invert the schedule, right? Revit can't do this automatically. The way that you see here right you can't have mm -hmm. it be like the types this way and the levels this way mm -hmm. um so there's a trick here this is actually um using a formula so what i have is inside i'm going to open this one because there's a few more um things that you can see because this this one has this one has all of the types condensed down into a single row um, and this one has them all separated. So what you have to do is you actually have to create a parameter. So I have this parameter and it can be a shared parameter um, or can, if you're going to use it in all your projects. Um, and you actually, cr and this is made off of an area schedule. So the way that, that I um, teach doing unit matrix and doing units is actually using an area um, an area scheme, because then you can put the edges where you want them to be, because every single owner has a different idea of like what is rentable 
mm-hmm. in their unit, right? So some say it's the face of the wall. Some of them say it's the center of the demising wall. Mm-hmm. Some of them say it's like the outside face of the corridor wall, you know. And so with an area, you put those area boundaries where you want them to be. And so you use areas. So I created this parameter called scheduled level, okay? And I put the value. So then once I draw all of my areas on a floor, I literally just select them all and fill out the value for whatever level they're on. Okay, so these are all in level one. And this is an integer parameter just because it doesn't need to be anything mm-hmm. but an integer. Um, and then these columns here are actually formulas to invert this value. So you'll notice here, right, that there's a one here because there's a one here. And there's a one here because there's a two over here, right? So I'm going to show you what these formulas are. They're they're like surprisingly simple when you think about it. <laughs> so... If you look at this formula, okay, it's just a number and it's just a simple if statement. If scheduled level equals one, put a one in this column, otherwise put a zero. That's it. So the level one says equals level one. The level two one says equals level two. And you just have to make one of these for every level that you have in your building. Okay, so that's why it says one here, but it says zero in all the rest of these, right? Because this one is not is just a zero because it's it doesn't equal two it equals one and so then if i go back here to this one where it's all condensed together now it will do it this way and then it will actually put zeros because that's the other issue right is that if you do it the normal way and you um don't have certain units on a level the row won't even show up right because revit's not going to show a zero and so this is how you can also show that there aren't any of a particular thing on of that one on that level. So this is like a, this is, this is one of those fun little, like, this is how you invert, you know, the information (laughs) to, to make it um, show in a way that you want to see it. Right. And then, yeah. (laughs) And then the other thing I did here is then I had to create this, this manual count because the count parameter in Revit, you can't put it in a formula. It's really frustrating because there's a count parameter, right? That just yeah. puts a one mm-hmm. so you can add things together. But when you try to make a calculated value, you can't use the count parameter in a calculated value. So you have to make your own fake count parameter. <laughs> So, so this is just, this is like a count parameter. It's just a fake integer. I selected everything and I put a one in it and then it fills it out for you. And then, then this is just calculating the totals. And I made this because then I made this parameter, which does percentages. So this, this particular parameter, the percentage one, right, is a calculated value. I don't know if you noticed, but when you make a calculated value, you either have formula or you have percentage, Mm -hmm. right? So all the other ones have been formulas, but this one's a percentage. And then you pick what the parameter is that you want to do it of, and then you do it by, this is silly, I don't know why it has a name in there. You do it by grand total. So then it's giving you the percentage of this row divided by the grand total, and it gives you the percentage of the total. So this is how you can get what your percentage is of each type. Mm-hmm. Um, of unit in your building and so in the in the blue column you had to uh manually add all, all these values That's yep, what you're yeah saying. so if you look at this other schedule yeah. see how it's just a one yeah 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 <laughs> yeah and, and so. okay so this is the the working schedule and the other one is the one that goes they're both working schedules i just okay, have them okay. sorted differently okay okay um because in this one i was just showing i wanted to show the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. percentages the percentage, yeah yeah because then then this one i wanted to actually talk more about the headers and the footers Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so that's why i had it done a little bit separately Um, and i actually wanted to talk about something else in this one um but so so i think i think in this one that was kind of all that i had yeah so inverting the levels having to do the silly manual count parameter and then how to make a percentage. Mm -hmm. Um, Because in this one, this area is actually adding up all of the one bedrooms together. This is the other thing that you can't do directly inside of Revit is you can't um, show an average in a cell. It's just Mm -hmm. not possible. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you can, you can do it with Dynamo. So one of my clients actually with their unit schedule, they, uh, they use Dynamo to, push back the average value, the average of a unit, right? Because you may have a bunch of one bedroom A's that are slightly different by like 
three to five square feet, but they're essentially the same. So you just want to put the average square footage. You have to push it out to Dynamo and then push it back um, into your schedule. So then every time you update it, you just run the script again and then it pushes the value. So uh, you because you can't make Revit do it. I've tried and it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I know. So many no average. We wish it's really frustrating. <laughs> um, all right. So then the other, let's see, how are we doing on time? All right, 7.45. I got a lot of things, but that's cool. Yeah. Uh, so then the next thing I want to show here was a way to get around the silly rounding stuff that Revit does, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that everybody who's tried to add things in Revit has found that you round your you round your area but then the, the the total is doesn't actually equal what it would be if you added them up because even though you're seeing a rounded number it's adding an actual number down to however many decimal points revit does right and yeah, that's really because, frustrating because there's no um how do you call it the formatting uh there's, for there's the just totals yeah there's just, well there's just no way to tell revit i want you to add the values that i see not mm -hmm. the actual values <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. And so what you have to do is you have to turn the actual value into an integer and then add the integers and then you're going to get the right number. Right. So mm -hmm. so this is what I that's what I did here. So I'm going to I'm going to show you like see how this one is 13, 836.5. Right. If I rounded it, it would say 37. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it would round up here this row actually turns these into integers. So where you really notice it is if I come down here to this one, like this one says 18, like 578, and this says 18,576, because I these these are all rounding whichever way is closer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to show you how you do that. So this area rounded is a calculated value, and it's literally just taking the area, dividing it by one square foot, and making it an integer. Okay, so you have to do this, otherwise it'll tell you that you have inconsistent units. Um, so you have to turn it into a unitless number, which because it's an integer, right? So I do that, and it it makes a nice rounded number for me. The only problem here is integer values you can't format what the number looks like so i can't put a comma you know in there for the digits and stuff like that and i can't add the little um the label for the square mm -hmm. footage so then i had to make another one that turns that back into an area so then all this does is it just multiplies it by a square foot and it turns it back into an area yeah oh, okay <laughs> so it's like you have to add like two extra columns um, yeah, units can be tricky and calculate but, values, yeah, right? They can. You sometimes have to divide by one or something like that to get yeah, the it's, correct. Yeah, it's units. usually with like the square footages that mm -hmm. it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. So, so that's like the trick that I use to set the number to be the actual number that I want to see. And if you want it to round to two decimal points, you can do that too. It's just more complicated because you actually have to integerize it times like 100 and then you have to divide it by 100 and you get the decimal points <laughs> so it's easier when it's a whole number yeah um to get it to set but this is how you can make sure that your total actually matches what this number what these are added up together so That's these are cool. the like gymnastics that we have yeah. to do sometimes to make the things work the way that we want yeah them to i work. know if they could just <laughs> fix it right no um so that's so that's that thing. That's that's fun. Um, and then the next thing I wanted to show is back to this sheet list. So a lot of times, right, on your sheet list, you want to be able to see all your sheets, and then you want to have a little checkbox as to which submission that sheet is part of, right? So like if you had your SC submission and you had a certain number of sheets and then in your DD submission, you added another five sheets, you wanted to like see which ones weren't in the first one and which ones are in the second one. Or if you have like a master sheet list and these are like, these are all the sheets I'm going to provide, but in this submission, I don't have these five, right? But you still want to have them in the list. Um, you want to be able to kind of make that little box. So this is the, the trick. And it's also another calculated value. There's lots of uses for calculated values <laughs> inside of Revit. Um, I want to show you what the actual schedule looks like first. So this is what 
Um, this is what the schedule looks like. So you have your name and you have this little box, right, that you can ch that you add this little box for whichever revision or whichever submission that mm -hmm. particular sheet is on. Um, so how that works is here in the sheet list. I'm just going to hide some of these because we don't need them. Um, I have two parameters. So this is a yes, no parameter, right? It's a checkbox. So you can go in here and you can either on the sheet, you can check the box or here in the schedule, you can check the box. And as soon as you check the box, it automatically puts a little, um, a little dot over here. So if I go here and I check the box, see it added a dot, let's zoom in. Check the box, add a dot. Okay, so how does that work? Our calculated trusty D&D calculated values. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to uh, copy and paste a symbol from uh exactly from like the character map yeah. so whatever symbol you want to use a square a dot yeah. a star a whatever tutorial something similar but it was yeah. a uh, a dot yeah but squares squares looks nice too whatever symbol you want yeah it um, could be a heart if you want it could it could it could be a little smiley face <laughs> I don't know whatever you want it to be. So you just have to copy paste that from the character map and then um, it will show up there. Uh, and so, yeah. So if it equals one, do that. Otherwise, nothing. Um, so that's a little, that's just a fun little trick that I like to do. Um, let's see. So I have like two more things that I want to show. And then I don't know if we have other. Are there any other questions? Uh, so far, so good. Okay. If you if you guys have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask in the chat. Please, please do. I mean, I could talk all night, but um. <laughs> <laughs> so then the the last couple of things I want to talk about. Let's go ahead and close all these. Um, is uh. Oh, actually, I forgot one other thing that you had asked me to talk about. So we're going to do that first. So I'm going to go here. So you t you asked me about images yeah. and yeah, schedules, yeah, yeah. right? So this is a schedule that has some images in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the schedule itself looks like this. Okay. So these are little furniture families. Now, there are, there are two ways that you can put images into your schedules. They can either be an instance or a type, all right? So these ones are actually a uh, type. So if I go into my properties and I look here, I have this little type image parameter, okay? So what that means is if I open, let me open the family. Um, if I open this table family, okay, and I go into the, the family types, <clears throat> down here under type image, there's this little image and the image lives inside of the family itself. This is really cool. You just want to be careful because it will make your families really large if you put lots of images in them, right? So if you have like a family and you have five different types and you've attached an image to each type, you now have five images embedded inside of your family. So you want to be careful with this because it can make your families large. Okay, so that's inside the family. It's inside the family. Yeah. And that's, so, that's a system parameter that you cannot remove, mm -hmm. right? Oh, okay. Yep, it's a system parameter. Yeah. So you just pick the image, right? And it puts it in the family itself. So you have it there. So it always will go with that family, which is has, which has its own benefits, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be great for things that don't have a lot of types, like a chair <laughs> or even like a table. Um, the only issue is, is with like something like a table, um, you, would, you might want to have a different image for like different sizes of it. And so, oh, yeah. okay, yeah, that's because that's by type. So if you have a family with like 12 types, you could have 12 image in the, the mm -hmm. same family, right? Yeah. Oh. So you want to be careful with that unless your image is more of like a representational image and then you could apply the same image to mm -hmm. all the types, right? Because if it's just like a rectangular table and it's just different sizes, you know, you might not need a different image to go with each one, but um, especially if it's like a, like a catalog, like a photograph, like an actual photograph versus what I used here, which is which is a screenshot, um, you know, of the of the family. And uh, my question is the the sizing of the image. Do you know how that works? <laughs> it's based off of the size of the column. So oh, the size of make, the column. Yeah. So if you make oh, okay. the 
if you make the column bigger or smaller, the images get bigger or smaller. And, and so let's say you have a kind of a super vertical image. That is, is it going to create a super high uh, row? Um, it'll go based off of, yes, it will, because it'll okay. go off of the okay. width of the image. Okay. Yeah. So, so, it's so you not... have to think about it. So maybe you have kind of a square shaped image for everything. So it's uh, exactly. better looking formatting, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you do need to think about that as you're as you're doing it, because yeah, this can look kind of funky, right? Like with because the wider the, the wider you make the column, kind of the bigger each of your rows get. Um, now, if you don't want to do it as a type, you can also there is a parameter that is just image by itself, right? So if I add that one, that's an instance parameter. So I can go here and I can just click, and then I can add. The image that I want. So, and so that would be in inside the project. Yeah, and so this lives inside the project. Oh, okay, yeah. interesting. So, Are so, these imported or linked? Um, I believe that's a good question. Let's see. Probably imported, if uh, probably because the um, linked images are only in the oh path type. Okay, it seems like a link. I don't looks know. like a link. We'll Let's have to see. investigate. Well, remember, so remember, yeah. linking linking images only appeared in twenty one. Yeah, I know. So, I know. um, so it it could be. Let's see. Yeah, it linked it. So it automatically defaults to a link, which is good. I mean, because then it's not embedding it into your project. Yeah. Right. And reduce so, the size. So if you want yeah. to avoid the bulky. Uh, families, you can in theory use instances and like the images. Mm -hmm. And you could link them. Yeah. So this way they'd be linked. So if you do it inside your project, but then you have to do it for every single one in every project, right? Mm -hmm. Versus having it be part of the family. So it's weighing the pros and the cons um, of doing it that way. So, um, yeah. So that's how you add images both as type or as uh, instance in your. Um, Great. Well, that was helpful. Schedule. So uh, let's see. Let's close that. Um, then one thing, then another another type of schedule. There's, there's two other types of schedules that I really like to use inside of my projects. Um, one is one that's for your model uh model maintenance and kind of helping you understand what's going on in your project. And that is a view list. So I know that, you know, when you go to view and schedules, view list is that one at the very bottom. And I know a lot of people don't really use them, but they're super useful. I put them in every single one of my templates because a view list is a way to see all of the views that show up under the view section, right? Schedules and legends don't show up in here. I wish there was a way to like make a list, a, a schedule of schedules, <laughs> but there's not, uh, not inside of Revit directly anyway. But this is a list of all of the views in your project. So the great thing about this is it makes it really easy to go and rename views because you can do it from here, right? You can just click on any of these and you can rename them. You can make sure that they're on the right phase. You can make sure they have the right phase filter. You can make sure that they have the right view template. You can check what level, what the associated level is for your uh, plans, right? To make sure that I called it level one and it actually is level one. Because I can't tell you how many times I've seen people like accidentally that change the name of a floor plan mm -hmm. to be like the wrong level. and. And it, it might say that it's level three, but the associated level is actually level two. So this is how you can check all of those things very, very easily together in a schedule, right? And you can even set the, um, you can like any of the parameters that are available to you in your views, you can set. So you can set the detail level, the discipline, the scope box even, which is great. Uh, you can do the name on the sheet. You can see the scale. Uh, so all of these things you can include in this schedule, and this is the ultimate like working schedule. So you resort it and refilter it however you need, right? So if I've gone and created a whole bunch of new views because I just added five levels into my project and I made, you know, 10 views to go with each of those five levels, I can come in here and very quickly rename them. Uh, I know there are utilities out there to do that, but if you don't have them, or you know you're not so dynamo savvy to write them, then you can do it here, and it's relatively easy. 
Uh, Because you can copy paste from like one to the next and just change the level name. So this is a super, super great model management tool to help you. And you can even, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, this has the same like the freeze headers. And if you delete a row from here, it will actually delete the view from your model. So you can clean up your junky views that you don't need, right? All your section five, section 82, section 375 that you have no idea what it is. <laughs> you can clean those out from here because you can just lead it from here. So, um, and so you, would you place uh, that kind of schedule on any sheet, kind of working sheet or not really? You just uh, no, use I it. I just have it. Mm -hmm. Hello, Pervy. Oh, hello, Pervy. Oh, okay. Uh, can you share again? Sorry, I think it's my internet might, might have bugged. Sorry about that. Can you see it now? Yeah, and we're back. Okay. Awesome. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry for that little stuttering. That's uh, live stream. That's live no. streaming for you. It keeps it interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so let's see how much time do we have left? Not too much. Oh, it's eight o'clock. Well, do you want me to, I have a couple more things. I don't know. Or should we, um, it's, it's up to you if you have something else. Uh, I don't want to hold you back too long, but yeah, if you, you want to go ahead, you can. Too. <laughs> I can do a few more minutes. I just, uh, I know my, my family is all like hiding in the basement. <laughs> all right. Sure. Sure. <laughs> but I, I can do a few more minutes there. I'm sure I don't hear them. Well, so they'll be fine. Do you want to have a look at the questions? Um, yeah, let's see if we have any. Any questions? Uh, there's a few questions about um, uh, mechanical. Any tips on conduit run schedules? That's your, uh, not your uh, specialty. I, right? I am I am mostly architecture, so unfortunately, I cannot yeah, answer questions about Another any question of the about MEP types. schedules. Unfortunately. Um, and uh, how would you add a symbol to the schedule? I don't know what that means. Uh, add a symbol. Asked by Jordan. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, if you, if it was an image, you could add an image. Mm -hmm. If it was like a, like a special character, you could add a special character just by copy and pasting from the character map. Mm -hmm. But if it's like, maybe you're thinking like an electrical symbol or something like, um, like a generic annotation symbol. So if it's like a duplex or, you know, a data symbol or something like that, I think you'd have to just do the same thing with the image. Uh, All right. Well, Jordan, you can in. clarify your question. Yeah. Else, I hope that answered. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what else you have, but I do have a, a question. So, sure. from uh, what I've read on your blog, you've been uh, teaching on Tetwin. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I can show you that one. So that's yeah. super fun. So, so for one of my clients, we were trying to put together like a list of classes, like internal training and trying to decide like who needed to go into which training class. And I was like, you know what? We could probably use Revit for that. And the bin manager was like, what? And I was like, just, just you wait, I'm going to show you something cool. So I went away for like a half an hour and I came back and, um, and I made this, I'm going to show you what I made because, and I totally just pulled like star wars names because i couldn't put the actual names of the people in my presentation yeah, yeah, that sure, work sure. at this company so i changed them all but um but i have so 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 i made a floor plan all right and i made rooms and each of my classes is a room okay so um they're like that and then each of my people are like little um I made these into groups so that I could, because I group them by like the type of person. Because like, for example, like if it's interiors versus base building versus project managers versus production staff, and I made them different colors based off of like their category. And then I made little model groups and then I put those groups in the different classes, right? So each of these is a person, right? So you can mm -hmm. see like they're each a person in their class. And so these are these are my rooms for my classes. And because you can do embedded schedules in a room schedule, that was what I used. This is how I also do, like I, I gave the, my very first built, I gave a presentation on doing signage in Revit and I did the same thing with an embedded schedule. And so that's what gave me the idea. And so if I go here to my schedules, 
um, I have this one where it's sorted by room and then there's the subcategory of the people that are in it, right? And as I move people around into different classes, they get added or subtracted from here based off of what room they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have it by person. So then I listed each person and I listed what classes they were in. So they know their schedule, right? Um, and then I listed it by, and then I had also given each person like a skill level. So whether they were beginner, intermediate, advanced, or expert, and um, and then I also sorted it by that. <laughs> so so, so Greedo is, is a guru, thing. right? Apparently he is. Greedo is a level five. Good job. Too <laughs> yeah. bad he was shot. <laughs> Along first. with the robots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. And okay, and on uh, the plan view that you showed me, uh, were you d using a color fill legend? Um, so this is actually um, a, it's not a color fill legend. It's okay. actually V filters. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's a filters. Okay. Yep. And it was based off of, I guess their, their level. Yeah. So I use view filters and then those parameters, right? So like if I, um, yeah, I, I love see, that. Right? That's, <laughs> that's just a cool use of Revit schedule. Yeah. And you, you know, you're a next level uh, Revit nerd when you. <laughs> We're well, using for other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it, really I mean, cool. it was like it's it's it totally makes sense to me in my mind. I was like, I can I can I can embed a schedule of any of objects that are in room, so that makes sense. And then it works out because it's like a classroom, right? So there's our classroom and the people in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. So. so All right. That was like a fun thing. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, it's 8.06, so I don't want to hold you back too long. If your family yeah. is uh, hidden in the basement, yeah. I think it's time to uh, let them uh, come back. Let them go to bed. Yeah, so, um, so just a second here. That bothers me. Okay, so thank you, Pervy. That was amazing. I've learned a lot already. Good. I'm really I'm happy glad. that you came to the show. That was fun. I'm sure people... Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah this was really fun. It's fun to to share what I know and mm -hmm. you know it's it's always it's always fun for me to share information and I, I like doing it in person more because I really get a lot of joy from like seeing people's lives light up when they're like oh my gosh I didn't know you yeah. could do that thing <laughs> so it's a little harder when I can't see any of the I people know. that are that are watching but um, I know I can feel everybody's energy from yeah, you can feel the energy <laughs> from the chat for sure and uh, yeah, I yeah. guess you have to come back at some point to talk about historic preservation. Sure, can talk uh, about. I actually did a presentation on BIM for historic preservation mm -hmm. for like a local uh, symposium here, where oh, I built a whole cool. Revit model with using using um, talking about that and kind of using it to help us figure out how the building was put together and stuff. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to to share that information too. All right, that sounds Anytime. super interesting. All right, Pervy, thank you so much for uh, joining the show. Yeah, thanks so. for having me. And everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. You learned something. And um, yeah, drop me a line. You saw my, my Twitter was at the beginning. It's Yeah, yeah. Any, anything you want to plug or your name of my uh, CAD Microsystem, any URL, I will add them all to the description of the video. Awesome. Anything else you want to plug? Mm, I'm trying to think. I don't think I have anything else at the moment so what what kind of services do you offer you create templates so and... yeah so so we we kind of do anything and everything related mm -hmm. to to revit so we uh we have architecture structure mep so i focus on interiors base building and landscape those are kind of the three types of companies that i help and i've done i do like revit implementations i do teaching we do like road mapping so mm -hmm. we can look at your processes and help you figure out where you are, what your outcomes are and all the steps and like the software and the training and the, um, all the things we have a, we kind of have a five-step process for Revit implementations for, for success. And we found that, you know, it seems to be the best. So we do a lot of custom training, a lot of custom content and, um, template work. And then I just do some random troubleshooting. I, every Wednesday I have one firm where I just help them with that. I literally spent all day today just helping people fix problems and make families and, you know, all that sort of thing. So 
I, it's funny, I go and I help people and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I have to bother you. I'm like, you forget, that's my job. Yeah, that's like, your job. Yeah. I'm here <laughs> to be bothered. You're not bothering me. <laughs> that's and, like and so literally you, why I'm here. <laughs> you said you do some landscaping work as well? Well, no, I mean, landscape architecture. Like yeah, I, yeah. I've done some, some uh, templates for some landscape firms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, which is always a fun... Yeah, the site, site stuff. Are, it's uh, hmm. site it's a little bit more difficult. I mean, I definitely have learned a lot from others who have done it, uh, and you know some of the chips and tricks and stuff like that. Um, with with how to use different things, like using you know railings for curves mm -hmm. and um, things like that. So I think it's uh, there's still I mean there's still stuff that needs to be done to make landscape work better, but. I we've I actually I think I put out like three proposals just in the past week for landscape firms to help them move to Revit because they're finding that the architects they work with really want the landscape stuff in in Revit so that they can coordinate especially the stuff that's on structure or around buildings right so mm. like roof terraces or sidewalks and landscaping or or outside amenity spaces around buildings that's not too hard to do in Revit I think large gigantic landscapes are a little bit more difficult, but the things that directly touch buildings, uh, it's not actually that heavy of a lift, mm -hmm. I think, to do that in Revit. All right, so having a final glance at the chat, everybody says, uh, thank you, Pervy, learned a lot. Dang, yeah. I missed this convo. <laughs> you can watch the replay, no problem. Exactly, it's all recorded. It's all recorded. So anyway, thank you so much, Pervy. I'm gonna let you go back, yes. to your, let your family come back up upstairs. All so right. thank you very much. Yeah. See you later. And uh, right. bye, everybody. Next episode is next week with uh, Josh Rattle. We're going to talk about Enscape 3.0. So goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.